transformers, communication resources, and faster and more reliable technology. Higher performance, communication resources, and faster and more reliable deeper in the in the environment or maybe even dump the registry to do things like credential theft right? uh, things like mount a remote drive download a script and run it. We can access uh, the volume shadow copies to even copy out things like locked files. We can execute malware anywhere we want really in the body. We can, we can execute malware only in memory, malware that doesn't touch disk now. Right? It gets very, very scary fast when we, when we move kind of in this, in this new modern world of, of PowerShell that we're sitting. Um, and so if you, uh, if you take anything away from uh, this presentation, it's that um, we are in the now PowerShell world. And this is a very, very scary world from a, from a defender standpoint. You know, my, my focus is very largely blue team. 
Uh, and when I think about this idea of what Microsoft has unleashed uh, upon our enterprises, it keeps me up at night. It is, the, I think, the number one threat that I see uh, us having to deal with in, in the next four to five years. They baked in a, an incredibly powerful, nearly all powerful capability uh, into the enterprise with very little capabilities to audit, uh, restrict it. In fact, there's really almost no way to stop it. You, can't, you can even get rid of the PowerShell binaries, and all someone has to do is come down and drop their own copy on. Even if you somehow restrict that through something like uh, I don't know, application whitelisting or soft restriction policies. We've got things like PowerShell Empire, which will allow you to just load up the actual .NET assemblies in memory and just run PowerShell commands that way. Uh, I don't know if anyone made it to uh, Carrie's talk uh, earlier this morning on, on her pen testing piece. She mentioned PowerShell Empire. She mentioned PowerSploit, which is the, probably the, if, if you really don't have any background on this, take 10 minutes, write it down right now, Go look at the PowerShell, the PowerSploit or the, the PowerShell Empire project, and if that doesn't scare you, <laughs> or excite you, depending what, what side you're on, um, then uh, <laughs> you need to find a new job. Um, it's amazing. Like, I've, I'm going to zoom in here so we can look at this for a minute. Yeah. Look at some of the PowerSploit options in there. Antivirus bypass, code execution, exfiltration, my favorite, mayhem, right? That's one of the newest components of it. That's things like being able to crash boxes or to do things like wipe the master boot record. Uh, so very, very scary. And I, you know, I won't ask for a, a show of hands because nobody's going to want to raise their hand now. But think to yourself, do I have PowerShell remoting on in my environment? Right? And I would bet we have a decent percentage of you do. And if you don't, you probably will in the future because as you start upgrading, for instance, server 2012, has PowerShell remoting turned on by default, which now you've unleashed uh, basically all powerful memory-only malware, or the capability, let's say, uh, within your environment. Right? And all you need now is domain admin creds, and you've basically got kind of God-level uh, privileges without n ever needing to drop kind of binaries on the, in the environment anymore. Right? So very, very scary stuff. Uh, you know, as, uh, as our friends in North Korea have showed us, um, it doesn't take much to cause an intense amount of damage. Yeah, and I think of like PowerShell remoting again. If you've got PowerShell remoting and your admins are using it in your environment, that's awesome. It's great for administration. But it also takes probably a three-line script to now, once I've got admin rights, to basically run out and start having all your systems wipe themselves. Right? And I haven't seen this actually happen in the wild, but I don't think we're very far from it. And we're seeing it across the board. We're, we're certainly seeing more advanced adversaries employ it. So uh, for, for the last several years, we've seen, for instance, Chinese adversaries uh, at, the, at the upper level of the, of the spectrum kind of moving more to PowerShell because they know that it leaves less forensic artifacts. Uh, but now we're seeing it kind of go all the way down to the commodity level. Uh, there's several instances. That in this case, this is PoshCoder, which is ransomware. Uh, but a lot of commodity malware, I'm noticing, is, is starting to turn to PowerShell as well. And largely because... Uh, most of us don't have tools to actually even discover it. It's, it's pretty stealthy out of the box, which is also why red teamers like it so much. Okay, so that's what we're dealing with. We've got, we've got a serious threat on the horizon, or maybe already uh, present in your network. The, the big kind of takeaway from that is, well, how am I going to find this? Um, so there's a few different ways. Uh, who are my forensics folks? I mean, just a hand, really? One? Come on. <laughs> But forensics folks are too shy to raise their hands, I think. But all right, so if you were a forensics person, you may know things like prefetch. For instance, we use this to show that things have been executed, or app compatibility cache, aka shim cache, or user assist. Um, so one of the first things I'm also often looking on the box is, do I see things like PowerShell.exe running? You know, why is this account, why is this standard user executing PowerShell? Uh, that could be somewhat of a, of a clue, depending on how prevalent it is in your environment. So we might be looking at these just to get a feeling for if I need to look deeper. Right. Now, if someone's been like double-clicking on PowerShell scripts, you may see things like these link files or shortcut files for those scripts, and you'll get the nice script names where it was run from. Uh, you might also look for kind of some of the helper functions. So if WMI is in play, you'll see this WMI uh, priv SE uh, process that, that was running, uh, W script for kind of VB script, which is often kind of coupled uh, with, our, with our PowerShell. And then finally, we'll talk a little bit about memory, which actually turns out to be one of the better places uh, to find this activity. 
And so nobody wanted to self-identify as being forensics, but if you were forensics, you might have heard something called uh, a super timeline. Uh, and so what we do is we end up uh, basically gathering up hundreds and hundreds of different kind of artifacts in the box, putting them in a nice timeline, and if we get to the right place or the right time, they start to tell a story about what happened on a system. Uh, and so kind of walking through here, you know, I know this is kind of, let's see if I can zoom it first, folks in the back. So we see, for instance, PowerShell.exe executed. Yeah. We see immediately after that, a couple of logs appear to have been kind of written to. Don't get too excited because until you get to PowerShell 5, you don't really get much of anything in there. Uh, followed by ping.exe and net.exe. Right. So I see PowerShell run, followed very closely by a couple of other kind of known commands. Right. At this point, I'd be making a guess, but net may be mounting shares. So maybe they're mounting a share to go out. Maybe they ping to find a box and then mounting a share on that box. Uh, followed very shortly thereafter by a creation for a file called WinINet. Totally legit. Right. Click here. Right. Followed by a prefetch file that tells me that that new file was executed. Followed by another command called FindString. What does FindString do? It's kind of like a ghetto version of, of grep for Windows. So they're looking for something. What do you think they were looking for? We don't have the command for it. What do you think they found? Anybody notice that directory? Oracle database. So they must have been looking for maybe fine string for some sort of Oracle type of um, file names. Whatever they found, it looks like uh, shell bags tells us folders that, uh, that uh, an individual account has been in. So it looks like they've been pillaging around in the Oracle folders, followed very closely by FTP. That can't be good, right? And then schedule tasks and another interesting um, kind of file called SVC at the bottom created there. But you notice within about like 10 or 12 lines, we've got a pretty interesting idea of some things that have happened on this box, right? So what was this? This was, you know, within about 20 minutes of PowerShell kicking off, I've got things being looked for. I've got damage assessment information. Looks like they're looking for Oracle. I've got a couple new kind of binaries that I need to go look, look at and a little bit of kind of tradecraft. Maybe they're mounting shares to move the environment. But you notice a lot of maybes and probabilities when I was talking through that. And that's because, for one, we don't have perfect information. The other is that when someone drops into like PowerShell or starts kind of running scripts, all of a sudden I don't have a, as many forensic artifacts as I typically would. Uh, a lot of like the PowerShell commandlets leave nothing, right? They, they could have run 100 PowerShell commandlets in there and a whole script full of them. And it won't show up in my, in my standard kind of timelining that we do in forensics. Right? And that's the real danger here, is that if this is all I've got, it becomes hard for me to piece together kind of what happened on the box. So this is where memory is going to be really helpful to us if we have access to RAM. Uh, I don't know if any of you, nobody wanted to self-admit to be in forensics. How about memory forensics? Any reverse engineers or people that have done memory forensics? It's one of the more exciting uh, kind of innovations in the field for a long time. It's, uh, it's a game changer because basically anything that ever happened on that system of interest has at one time been in memory. Right? So if I get lucky and I get memory and I can dig through it properly, I might, I might be able to identify what, what actually happened. Right? And so this is an interesting command that you hope you don't see on your domain controllers. Looks like someone's dumping Active Directory, dumping credentials. If you were to get to that box while that terminal was still up, you could run a very simple command called doskey, and it would actually show you the history of what was typed in that terminal, right? per user account or per session. Right? The only problem is it only sits in memory, that history, and it actually goes away when that terminal gets closed, or at least the, the history goes away. It still could be resident in RAM. Right? And so this is one thing we're going to be looking for. Um, and so, a couple smart folks, Stevens and Casey, they did some, some research on this, and they came up with a way to basically carve out that command history buffer um, out of memory. Right? And so that was kind of the state of the art until not too long ago. Um, what they, where they found it is it's actually in a, a very reliable location. It's in a place called Conhost in Windows 7. And so this is the process that actually draws the windowing uh, on your boxes. So it kind of draws the terminal window. And it just turns out that history lives there. Right? So if I can get access to that con host process, right, I have a decent chance that maybe I can recover those old command lines that were actually typed by the attacker in there. Right? Same with PowerShell. It's also nicely stored in the con host. 
the, by default, the last 64 commands that have been run in a, in a PowerShell terminal will be in that command history if we can get to it. Yeah. And then I threw one in there just for fun. Anybody had to deal with web shells? Pretty, uh, pretty ninja, like small amounts of code thrown on a web server that basically turns it into a back door. Well, depending how the web shell is written, some of the web shells are basically just kicking off cmd.exe. And you'll notice this. Some of you may recognize the W3WP process. That's your IS worker process. That is not normal behavior. Right? If you start seeing command terminals dumping off of your IS processes, well, that's a pretty good indication you've got issues. The good news is in these situations, we can also often recover command lines that were typed in a web shell because they're nicely using the same kind of terminals um, that, that an adversary on the console itself would be using. Um, so we'll be looking for kind of all those to try to piece together what happened on a system. So I say this is kind of old school because this, is the, this was the state of the art 12 years ago, right? I remember like dumping RAM on Linux boxes and, and searching through it with strings. It's still just as effective today as it, as it was then. So what we often might do is take those con host processes, dump out the process itself, just pull strings across it, just like you do when looking at a binary. And in many cases, you'll recover old command lines. Right? It turns out to be a pretty effective means. Uh, and so I've got on the, on the left over here some things that just, this is only limited by your imagination, but things like looking for file names, you know, .exe, uh, HTTP or FTP or RAR, if you've got an attacker that's actually RARing things up to, to exfiltrate out of the environment. Um, so still very, very effective. Uh, the new school is going to be actually moving to like a true memory forensics tool. Has anyone ever used volatility before? Yeah, it's, uh, it's by far the definitive number one tool for doing memory forensics. One of the nice things about memory forensics is that the best tools are all free. All right, so if you want, go uh, do a search on volatility. There's a ton of tutorials out there. But an um, individual on that, on that team wrote, uh, his name's Michael uh, Hell Lee, and he took some of that initial research that Owens and Casing did and said, well, if you tell me that it's in this process, I should be able to go find what it looks like and just write a plugin to actually do it on the fly so I don't have to pull just strings out to do it. And so what he did is he went through and he wrote a plugin called Command Scan for volatility. And what it will do is go through all the CSRSS or con host processes, look for the signature for what would be a command history, and try to parse it out. Right. And so this is running on a system. If I see this, it looks like I've got a few commands here. Nothing terribly exciting there. Looks like someone went to a temp directory and tried to output an a.txt file. Now, while he was doing this research, he stumbled upon something that I don't know if anyone else had documented before he did, which was there's not just that, that history buffer that I've been talking about. It turns out there's also what they call a consoles buffer. And this records not what was typed, but what was displayed in that terminal. So now we get full duplex. Right? We get both what was typed and what was actually displayed back to the user. So now, for instance, we know it looks like the specific username here was rlink. Right? And I actually see the directory listing. This is a lot more interesting to me than what we saw before, because do those look, the file names look legit? I'll give you a hint. You see, ever see a one-letter <laughs> one name of a DLL executable? I'll buy you a beer if it's not bad, right? So, um, and since they typed out that a.exe, you can't see it here because it was snipped. That was actually uh, all the credentials that had been dumped. And so you could actually see the output of what credentials they had actually gathered, you know, just by uh, pulling it out of the command history. So a couple really neat plugins. Uh, now that was from a cmd.exe. This is the exact same plugin being run and gathering up PowerShell data. And so who's heard of Invoke Mimikatz? That's from that PowerSploit project. Uh, it's ridiculous how often this is getting used now. I mean, both for advanced adversaries and like the, just the run of the mill. It seems like this is the number one thing that everybody wants to run on a box these days when they get access to it. Now, this gave us, gave us the entire contents, including all the output uh, for that invoke mimikatz command. So that's all coming out of RAM. And it's not just Windows. Uh, you can also do it in things like Linux. In fact, in fact, Unix has a much better, if you're dealing with the Bash world, a much better history capability. Uh, Bash history is incredible. You'll get thousands of commands, often time-stamped when the command was, was actually run on the box. Uh, and so this is another volatility plug-in. 
uh, called Linux underscore bash, which just pulls that bash history out of RAM, allowing us to, to piece together kind of what, uh, what an attacker might have done on that box. Okay. So that's one thing, is we can kind of recover these command lines. Uh, now, what if the command line was what we're looking at here? Right. Just a script name. That doesn't really help me. It's very, pretty generic. How am I going to actually recover the contents of what was in that script? Um, and so one option is we can actually go out and dump the PowerShell process itself. So use something like proc dump, this is internals tool, or your tool of choice to go just grab that process or grab all of RAM. Yeah. And, and the reason why this is going to be useful to us is you've got to think of the way PowerShell works. PowerShell is basically a scripting engine built on top of .NET. Right? And .NET is not like a native binary. Right? It needs to get compiled on the fly, kind of like Java. And so what's happening is you're running these scripts, they're getting compiled on the fly. Where they're getting compiled or where they're living is actually in this PowerShell process. Right? I've dumped PowerShell processes on systems that were 600 megs in size. Just gigantic amounts of space encapsulating tons and tons of these scripts uh, that have been run. Right? So now all we have to do is somehow search that process for something interesting. And, and to be honest, that's not easy because these scripts are just text. And anybody who's ever done like string searching for text, yeah, it's, you know, we're going to have, in a 600 meg process, that's probably billions of strings in there I've got to search through. Right. Um, so just for fun, what I did is I took the PowerSploit project and I went through it to um, try to identify the most common commandlets that were used across all of the, uh, the actual attack vectors in that project. And so if you know PowerShell, it's this kind of verb noun um, type of methodology for commandlets. You know, get proc address, write output. And so I was trying to identify, well, which ones might we just search for to actually try to figure out where the scripts are in that giant amount of data that we have to get through. And it turns out there's probably some de decent options in here. You notice the ones that have uh, the little kind of um, cross next to them, those are not native uh, PowerShell commandlets. So those would only be really um, kind of in a, in a PowerSploit uh, type of piece. The other one is like, you notice the number one is out-null. That turns out to not be a very commonly used commandlet. It basically just dumps output to the, the bit bucket. Uh, those of you that write a bunch of scripts, you know sometimes you just don't want data to, to actually kind of display. And so that's, what gets, that's why it gets used in a lot of the PowerSploit uh, type of pieces. But, but the idea here is what we're, we're thinking about strings that we might find. If you know your attackers are using Mimikatz, well, search for Mimikatz. Right? But I'm trying to just figure out some way to, to get to the good stuff faster. And so another thing we can do is we can also just search for those um, PowerShell script names. And so simple regexes for things like PS1 uh, might be useful. And I found this to be very, very um, effective at pulling out kind of script names and sometimes full paths for those scripts. So I can identify where my attackers are, are kind of dumping those in the file system. Um, so here's an example. So in this example, dumped out the PowerShell process here grab the Unicode strings out of it, and simply just did a quick grep search for Mimikatz. Right? And this, this case found the invoke Mimikatz kind of script and was able to recover the entire script out of that uh, process. And the reason why that, that's a big deal is anybody that's used that script before, that script is over 600K in size. Uh, it includes both the 32-bit and the 64-bit versions of Mimikatz, just Base64 encoded. It's, it's gigantic. Right? So if you can recover this out of RAM, you can pretty much recover any script if you just know what to look for. Right? We got lucky here because we actually knew that the bad guys were using Mimikatz. Right? But you know, whatever your string search was, the better, the better you know your adversary you know, or what your attackers are likely to have done, the more likely you might hit pay dirt. So this is just us simply looking for strings in that PowerShell process. Yeah. And then same idea, taking that PowerShell process, now doing the regular expression, looking for just PS1 files, the PowerShell scripts. And you notice, well, not only did they run Mimikatz, it looks like they also ran git vault credential, credentials and invoke DLL injection. And now I've got a directory. Looks like they like to dump their tools into the temp folder that, that we can then take advantage of. Yeah. All right, so lots of, uh, lots of kind of clever ways that we can pull this data out. Um, but, of course, every measure has countermeasures. 
And so instead of maybe actually using scripts, one way that you can execute code in PowerShell is you can use this encoded command option. Has anyone ever seen this before? Good. If you haven't, you're going to see it in a moment. Basically, you can just pass the PowerShell instance a big list of Base64 encoded script or functions, and it will nicely run it that way. Uh, never touches disk, only run in memory, right? And, then, and you can even, if you have PowerShell remoting, do this now remotely across one or more systems in your environment. Right? Very, very stealthy. The good news is it is limited in the amount of characters that you can pass. So for instance, invoke Mimikatz is far too large to actually kind of encode this way. Uh, the other good news is we can still recover these encoded commands, in some cases easier than the other scripts because they look more unusual. And once we recover them, we can just unbase 64 them, and we're good to go. We can figure out what it was actually run on the box. Yeah. And I don't know if anybody's uh, deep into the weeds, but now I'm noticing, well, I don't want to deviate too far because we've got a lot to talk about, but I, the most recent kind of ninja activity now is not just encoding in base 64, they're also now base 64-ing uh, gzips, which have shell code in them. And then on the fly, unzipping the shell code and executing uh, the individual byte code on the fly, all in RAM, all from just kind of an encoded script. Right, so it's getting, yeah, the, the, the attack is getting uh, more advanced and more advanced almost every day. Right. So anyway, we can kind of find these. You know, one of the things I'm often looking for is things like uh, encode, dash encoded command, dash ENC. One of the really frustrating parts of PowerShell from a defense standpoint is it is so flexible. Right? You can name your options almost anything you want. As long as you can uh, provide enough data to, to be a unique match, you can pretty much change your parameters to be anything. You can't kind of, there's not just one way to do an encoded command, for instance. Right? So you've got to look for all these different permutations and variations, uh, which is kind of a nightmare. Um, the good news is once you find one, though, very often your attacker will end up using the exact same way each time, and that way you'll know to look for it in the future on other systems. So this is what it kind of looks like. It just turns out that if they actually use that dash encoded command, I found a, a really great string to look for is this raw argument string. Uh, very commonly, it will actually encapsulate the entire Base64 encoded script, just nicely sitting there, again, in the, uh, out of the PowerShell process. All I got to do is take this now, unbase64 it, and figure out what that script was. So right now, that tends to be a pretty reliable way to pull that, um, those encoded scripts at a RAM. Okay, I mean, that works really well. Right? So hopefully you got a feeling that, yeah, I can pull out things like what scripts are run. I might be able to even pull out encoded scripts or even the entire contents of a script, like we saw with Invoke Mimikatz. Right? The only problem is <laughs> you actually have to have RAM. Right? And even if you have RAM, how do you scale it? Right? And so one of the big issues I see is, yeah, I can go and if you give me a box that you think is, is owned, I can rip through it and a few hours later have some great data for you. But that doesn't really scale well. You know, one of the things that PowerShell does really well from a, a red team side is it scales effortlessly. Right? So how do I actually do this across thousands or tens of thousands of systems? How do I search every box in my environment for malicious PowerShell scripts? And the simple answer is most people can't. Right? So I'm hoping that some of the takeaways that you'll walk away with today is you'll go back and like, how are we going to deal with this? Right, what are some options? And, and that's what this section is about. It's trying to give you a sneak preview of, of some options, and uh, I'll show you some. Um, I'm going to start showing you kind of a tool that, that CrowdStrike has called uh, Falcon Host. And basically what it is, is it's an endpoint flight recorder technology. Right, so you'll see, it, uh, you'll see what it looks like, but it's very similar if you have Carbon Black or Tanium or Microsoft Sysmon is, a, is another example of kind of a, a free kind of flight recorder tool out there. But what's happening is these tools are running at the kernel level, and they're basically recording kind of a, a, just an amazing kind of granularity of activity that's happening on those systems, including full command lines, right? which is how I got interested in all of this. So let's kind of take a look. Um, the back end of Falcon Host is actually Splunk. And so all we're going to be doing is looking at kind of our raw data sitting in Splunk. And so those of you that are Splunk users, this should look really familiar. And all I've done here is you know, do a quick search for you know, WMIC, nothing too exciting. Looks like we get 48 hits within that time frame. And then I can start to look at what the command lines look like. So you'll see, we, looks like we've got a process call create for, for netstat in this case. 
Right? Not, nothing terribly exciting there. Now, then I can start to use something like my back end. Once I can, I mean, imagine that whatever you have, you're pulling command lines from every box in your environment, you're dumping them into a big database. That's essentially what we're looking, for, looking at here. Now I can start to really pivot off that and kind of look for trends, look for anomalies. Uh, once I find something, look where else I've seen it in my environment. Right. That's where we can actually start to, to really make an impact here. And so now I just said, well, show me WMC and show me all the different variations. So I just, just count them all up and show me what the most popular WMIC commands are. All right, and so you notice that netstat command had a count of 10. Yeah, and we've got these kind of uh, different variations of commands going on there. Right. OK, so now let's look at a real attack. So this was a command. One of our analysts stumbled upon it, said, that looks really interesting. Right. What looked really interesting is a couple things. One is. How many of you have ever seen a JPEG execute? Yeah. Seems a little unusual, right? To be honest, this actually turns out to be a really good indicator. If you have a way to actually um, identify everything that's executed, like um, let's say you're in your event logs, you're doing process creation events, look for ones that don't have an executable extension. Right? Why do I have w.jpg executing from a command prompt? Right. The other thing is the full command line was actually this w.jpg space.txt, which I thought was kind of ninja. I didn't even realize you could do that. So it, the, the actual output file name, this was a, a credential dumper, if I remember correctly. The output file name was .txt, so it, didn't, it was just an extension, not even a file name. Right. The other thing that's unusual about this is why is the parent process of cmd.exe win logon? Right. Do I have any uh, Windows internals folks out there? Is that normal? Well, I can tell you it's not normal. Does anyone know what, what might cause it? How do I get a command, my logon process to actually spawn a command prompt? Let's see if uh, my live demo will work here. Um, gotta, I have a little VM. Anyone ever heard of sticky keys? Super old school attack. Literally walk up to a box, hit shift five times, see if it'll work. So do you want to run sticky keys? Um, yeah, why not? And you notice how it dropped me straight to a command prompt? So this is just a registry bit flip. Literally just change one registry key, and now I can go to what the accessibility options, aka sticky keys or onboard uh, keyboard or on-screen keyboard or whatever that is, and immediately drops me to a prompt. If I do a who am I on this, you're going to see it actually drops me to a system level privileges, right? which, whoops, let me get rid of this. All right, so now I'm at system. This is a fantastic way um, from an attack perspective to create the ultimate backdoor. Let's imagine that you've had your adversaries have been in your environment for three months. Right? You successfully remediate your environment. You kick them out. Right? So spear phishing starts again. Let's say two weeks later, another user clicks on a link. They're back in. You remediated all your passwords, though, right? So they don't have domain admin cred. They're back to, they're back to kind of square one again. If they can actually, say, RDP to a box where they've set up sticky keys and you didn't clean that up, they're immediately back to system. They can dump creds, elevate, and they're back in the game again and you don't even get an event log entry for it. <coughs> right? So it's all before uh, that actually all that happens. Right? So anyway, we're also looking for these kind of weird anomalies, like cmd.exe running under the IES thread or running under like the win log process. Right? And so that's the kind of the, the, the value of recording this information in the back end, is you get much more granular information about these strange anomalies. So anyway, found that a couple different ways. One was a very strange named executable. Another was, why is my logon process dropping off command uh, prompts? And by the way, this is, a, this is the, the change you have to make in the registry. So you basically go software, Microsoft Windows, current version, image, file, execution options. And you just change this, sethc.exe, add a debugger to it. What's the debugger? Command.exe. So now you also need a way to actually monitor all your registry keys through your environment. 
you should be looking for that. And if you actually see any changes to that key, you probably have something bad going on. All right, here's another example. So this was a PowerShell process. If I zoom in, you'll actually see this PowerShell process uh, spawned off 103 different commands. So whatever script it was running was a pretty big deal. We can get a little idea. It was just kind of kicking off a bunch of nets, pings, and scheduled tasks. Right? So a little strange. And what was happening here was this script was being used by attackers to essentially remotely push out credential dumping software through the environment, dump credentials, and then pull all the data back. So basically, they were looking for domain admin credits. <laughs> so they were, uh, they were basically pushing out their malware using scheduled tasks through a PowerShell script. Right? And you can see the command down here. It was one of those encoded commands. And if you have the right tool, it should be pulling out the full command line. So now all we had to do was just pull out that base64 and do very, very simple reversing to figure out what, what was actually happening there. Right. That alone should be unusual. If you have this, well, I would just set up a trigger to basically show me whenever an encoded command is run in my environment and tell your admins not to do that. Right? <laughs> Please. All right, one more. Does anyone know what taskeng.exe, what process that is? It's your task scheduler. And so this is task scheduler kicking off PowerShell. We can see the command down here. This is another very, very evil, um, or commonly evil, PowerShell. This is invoke expression happening here. And it's going out to the internet and downloading a script. And this would be the URL or the IP where it's downloading it from. Right, very, very common. So I don't even have to drop my script down. I can actually just tell PowerShell, hey, go to this location and pull my script and run it. And in this case, this was a, a scheduled task. Every two hours it would run, go out, pull whatever script happened to be at that location at that time, and execute it. So it was essentially their command and control. Right? Very, very simply implemented in PowerShell. All right. So of course, once we kind of have, if we're collecting all this data, if you've got all this data in a, in a database, this is now just like saying, well, show me anything with these parameters, PowerShell running with these parameters. And now you can see these would be all of your hosts that have likely been at attacked by those uh, adversaries because we're seeing every command uh, that fits that, that query being run on individual computers in the enterprise. Uh, this is where we have to get. I don't care what tool you have to do it. We've got to be collecting this data. Right. It's the only way to really make it feasible to investigate this stuff. All right, some good news. Um, Microsoft has not been totally oblivious to this problem. Um, they have actually implemented some, um, some free or, or built-in solutions uh, to start doing this. They may not be the most perfect solutions, but they're better than nothing. All right, so some of you may be familiar that uh, when Server 2012 came out, we do have now a capability to actually turn on command line auditing. If you don't have this on in your environment, you should really go back and consider it. Figure out a way to do it. Right? And so what this does is you do have to uh, turn on process creation events, which almost no one turns on process tracking because it's, it fills up the event log so quickly. Right? It is handy on its own, but if you turn on process tracking and command lines, well, all of a sudden you've got a pretty good way to go back in time and identify any malicious command lines uh, that have been run. So it originally only worked on 2012 and Windows 8.1, but it was so popular they've now gone back and ported it back. So there was a patch, you know, four or five months ago that now Windows 7 and above can actually uh, turn on this, uh, this tracking. Yeah. So this is what it looks like. So we're just in the event logs. You'll get these event 4688 events. Yeah, I'll uh, just zoom in here. And so this is just a process creation event for FTP. And now you'll notice that we get the full process command line. And so now I know not only FTP was run, it looks like they were running using a series of commands and something called one dot log sitting in the, the C temp folder. Right? Much more information than I would have had previously. And then if you look at this other one, this is another 4688 event. This is for a PowerShell event. And this was a PowerShell example using an encoded script. And it will capture the entire contents of that encoded script that then we can piece together what happened there. So very, very powerful. It's just you're probably going to have to centralize your logs because the, the amount of volume is going to be so big. Um, I, you should be doing that anyway, to be honest. Um, and you've got to get it turned on. You've got to get process tracking uh, auditing in your environment. 
And um, the PowerShell team has been trying to mitigate some of this um, <laughs> initial disaster that they've unleashed. And so we have had a series of each version of PowerShell adding in a little better logging each time. Uh, to be honest, the old school PowerShell version 2, um, you, could, you could transcript, but it was not a very nice way to do it. You could put in, in your user profiles to start a transcript and record all their commands into a, into a file. Um, really hard to manage, really easy to, to get around if you're a bad guy. So that's probably not very useful. Module logging showed up in, in PowerShell version 3. Again, the, the data is really funky. If it's all you got, um, turn it on. But it's really hard to work with. It's really noisy. Um, I find it almost uh, useless, to be honest. Um, finally, though, when we get to PowerShell version 5, uh, they've just released what they call script block logging and like a transcription feature. We'll see an example of it in a minute. This is finally getting to the point where we can actually use uh, PowerShell logging. Uh, the only downside is how many of you are in PowerShell 5 in the, in the enterprise? I bet zero. I bet most of you are still sitting at PowerShell 2, right? But as we start to move to Windows 10, Server 2016, that's all PowerShell v5 by default. So we're going to slowly get there. And so this is how you turn that auditing on. So we're just in the, uh, the group policy. And you can see now if you have PowerShell version 5 rolled out, you can turn on script block logging. You can turn on the transcription capability. And this is going to give very, very detailed information now in this PowerShell log. Traditionally, you'd have almost nothing of use in this log. But if you've got PowerShell version 5 with transcription or script block logging, now you're going to get like the full contents of every script. Right. So that's what we're seeing here. This was a, uh, a key logger. So we can kind of see here that was, was being run it's actually from the PowerSploit project, which is slightly obfuscated. And we nicely get the entire block, the entire function uh, that was run by that attacker here. Right. Now, I will tell you, you run Invoke Mimikatz with script block logging turned on, it's like something like over 100 events kick off. Five megabytes of logs for one script. It's crazy. Right? It's almost, uh, the sad part is I don't think Microsoft had a place to put the data. Right? They, they stuffed it into event logs. I, you know, they don't really have any other place to really log things effectively. So it's probably the right choice. But those of you that do event log analysis know it's really painful to get through event logs. So now one script is going to create over 100 logs, event entries. Right? The good news is um, this just recently came out. It's a little GitHub project. You point it at that PowerShell operational log. It will grab all of the different script blocks, put them all into one single entry. I'll put them into CSV. Right? So you either grab everything, put it into one, or per script that was run, it'll dump out individual CSVs for you. Right? So really, really powerful uh, capability to make it more useful. So I guess the, uh, the moral story is there's hope. <laughs> we have a long way to get there. We need some way to collect command lines. Uh, we need some way to, to bring these all data all into a, a database, put it in a, a readable format that we can actually analyze. Uh, but I tell you, once you do, this is an incredibly powerful uh, way to defeat um, advanced adversaries. I mean, we're seeing uh, the old days of following the malware. Uh, it just simply isn't working anymore. The, 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 the attackers have realized that that's how we've been identifying where they've been. Right? You used to follow the bouncing ball. Follow where the malware has been, you can tell where the attackers have been. Well, you've probably heard the, the techniques of things like living off the land. You know, when, you, when I'm in a PowerShell environment, it's not even hard to live off the land. The land is bountiful, right? I, it's the land of milk and honey. I can go and I can do anything. Right? So this is why we're going to see this much, much fewer binaries dropping on a box or malware and just attackers moving straight to PowerShell. If you don't have a way to collect this information, uh, you're going to be absolutely blind. Right? Probably already are absolutely blind, to be honest. All right, here's that, uh, that conference I wanted to, to tell you guys about. So this is coming in, was it, is it June? June of this year in Salt Lake. As I mentioned, we don't get them very often. So we will have a bunch of great at-night talks. If you want to go, you can go for free. Just go make sure to put your name on the list. Um, I would love to take questions. You guys have been kind of quiet. I know it's after lunch, but uh, I know PowerShell's not boring, so there must be something exciting to talk about, right? Yep? Are you going to have a 
Yeah, the question is, is the, the slideshow going to be available? I can absolutely get it to you. Uh, for one thing, uh, you can email me. This is also being recorded, um, so the, the recording will be up as well. But yeah, if you'd like a copy of the deck or something, feel free to, to drop me a line. I'll, I'll get it to you. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, so Google Rapid Response. Uh, it's, a, it's a neat project. So uh, Google Rapid Response is really, if you remember the Aurora attack that happened around, I guess, 2010 now. So Google got hacked by China. They were the first major company to come out and say, hey, we self-admit we got owned. Right? As part of that, Google really, really upped their game. They hired, I think, some of the best instant responders in the business. They invested heavily in security. They looked at a bunch of tools, and they said, we don't really see one that meets our needs. We're going to build our own. And that was Google Rapid Response. Um, they're still actively using it. Actually, it's not just them. I know a lot of the big companies. I know like Yahoo's using it. I'm pretty sure Amazon's using it. It's a, they, the wonderful thing is they open sourced it as well. Um, so I think it's a fantastic project. It's, I still see it as alpha. Uh, I see very few organizations that have rolled it out um, completely. Most that I know of are using it um, basically as a collection tool. So they'll, as you figure out a box is compromised, they'll push out an agent, collect data, and then pull it back. Um, it's very effective at that. I think it's a, it's a little harder to get it running kind of consistently across your whole, your whole enterprise. You're going to need dedicated resources, from what I hear, uh, to get that running. But it's a really neat project. I, th I think everybody should be aware of it and should be looking at it, because it's just getting better and better, and, and they're, they're investing a lot of resources into it. So it's called Google Rapid Response. What do you think? PowerShell, good, bad? We all gonna die? We'll, we'll definitely have a job for the foreseeable future, I'll tell you that. Uh, it's, um, I, I tell you, it's, I, I really, I think Microsoft has made some great gains. You know, I, from a security perspective, I think they've really um, taken security seriously over the last decade. But somebody was asleep at the wheel when PowerShell got released because how you would create something so amazing, so incredible, and then not really, you know, immediately have a way to lock it down and to audit it is just amazing. Like, who, who thought that was a good idea, right? I mean, we're in trouble. Man. Of course, I know we have a lot of red teamers. You're like, good. I hope you don't have a way. So <laughs> but we're catching up with you, so uh, be careful. Man. All right, well, thank you, everybody. I'll be up here if anybody wants to ask, ask questions. Enjoy the rest of the conference.